as we're gathered in for our evening session here, let us begin with a word of prayer at this time. Father in heaven, abide with us as we open up your words. Fill us with your presence, your truth, your spirit. May we reflect your image. And may we take heed to these signs and be prepared and do all that we can to get others prepared. Forgive us of our sins and bless us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have two segments this afternoon here, and we're going to be focusing on Revelation chapter 10 for our Q&A session, our Bible study. But before we do that, let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, and I would like for us to compare two particular scriptures Matthew 24 is the first, and the second is John chapter 16. John, the 16th chapter. And we are going to compare these two scriptures, and then we're going to transition. Let's begin with John 16, and then we'll run over to Matthew 24. The Bible says in verse 1, these things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. So what are they going to do? Number one, verse two. Number one, put us out of the synagogues. All right. Stay right there. Does that imply the restriction of freedom of worship? Amen? Put you out the synagogues. What do we do in synagogues? Worship. Now skip on down. So you see the restriction of freedoms. Yea, the time cometh, whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. What's the next step? This is a death decree. Death decree. Okay, what time period is this? How may we know how close we are to the fulfillment of these words? Now skip on down to verse 3. Let's read this and move on. Verse 3, And these things will they do unto you, because they have what? Not known the Father, nor me. But these are people that think they do who service? God service. What would we call this group of people? Professed Christians. But are they really genuine Christians? No, they are not. How may we know we're in this time period? Well, let's compare scripture with scripture. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 now. Look at verse 7. The time come, they'll put you out the synagogues. They shall kill you. How do we know we're in this time period? Matthew 24, look at verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then, what's that word? So these verses are connected, same time period. This is chronological. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall what, everybody? Uh -huh. And they shall kill you. So how may we know John 16 is about to be fulfilled? They'll put you on the synagogues, number one. Death decree, number one, by professed Christians. Hmm. When we see what four things in verse 7? Wars, famines, what else? Pestilences, what else? 
earthquakes, calamities in diverse places. Now notice, skip on down to verse 7. Pardon me. Come down to verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and you shall be hated. They shall kill you. You shall be hated. Of all what, friends? Nations. So if you compare John 16, those who do this think they do God's service, Matthew says, killed, hated by all nations. So what nations are these? Profess what? Profess Christian nations. In the first world, which nation preeminently claims to be a Christian nation? This one. This one. It begins right here, friend. It begins right here. Then it says, they shall hate you, kill you, for my name's sake. What does that mean, for my name's sake? What now? Character. Character. His name's sake. Character. What else? Name. Character. Name. And where must that name be placed? In our forehead. What else? Name. Character. Name points to the Sabbath. Sabbath. How do we know that? Give me two scriptures. How do we know name points to Sabbath? Give me two scriptures. Come on. Isaiah. Fifth. Go there with me. Hold your place in Matthew. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 56. Understand what's coming. Isaiah 56. Look at verse 6. Also, the sons... Isaiah 56, verse 6. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord. Love the what, friends? What again? The name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone that does what? Keepeth his Sabbath. They shall kill you for my name's sake. It's talking about the Sabbath. Give me one more scripture. Name, Sabbath. Name, God's name, Sabbath. Any more scriptures? God's name, Sabbath. Anybody else? New Testament, that's the hint. God's name, Sabbath. When I go there, you will recall it. Galatians. Chapter 4. Okay, what word, what name of God is in the word Sabbath? Raise it, don't shout. What name of God is in the word Sabbath? Raise your hand, Sabbath, Ra raise your hand, preacher, come on. Abba, let's go there. Galatians, what chapter? Four, Galatians chapter four. Look carefully at verse, let's begin verse six. Verse 6 says, And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, What, everybody? Abba, Father. That's it. They shall persecute you for my name's sake. Abba, Father. Abba, Sabbath. Abba, in the middle of the word Sabbath. All right. Let's get into this, my friends. Everybody, listen to my transition. What is the chief reason why God gave us the seventh day Sabbath? No choruses, no shouting, raise your hand. What would you say to somebody you meet in the marketplace as we would be going into the field shortly for evangelism? They ask you, why did God give to us, mankind, the seventh day Sabbath, what would be your response? Raise your hand, your, your, your response. Let me go in the back, all the way back there. Go ahead. I'm the Lord your God. I brought you out of bondage, etc. Wonderful. Something is akin to that. Anybody else? What would you say? Let me come over here. Go ahead. It is a reminder that he is creator. Creator. That's why. Now, which scriptures would you go to? I'm making my transition. I'm going to transition from the Sabbath 
to a movement to combat climate change to save Earth. You shouldn't miss it. We're going to be persecuted for seven-day Sabbath keeping. The seven-day Sabbath is a reminder God made the world. And the movement to do this is going to be a movement to save Earth. Who wrote the script? Who wrote the script? So what text shows us, we worship God because he's creator. What text? Give me one Old and one New Testament. Let me come here. I'll come to you. Let's go. Exodus 20, verse 8 to verse 11. Wonderful. Now, that's the easy one. Everybody knows that. Come over here. Come on. Don't tell me you're going to say the same thing. Come on. Revelation 14, verse 7. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made. Uh -huh. So we worship him as creator, as maker. Made what? Heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters. Give me two more scriptures. Come on. One more. Don't ask me. I'm asking you the question. Be firm. Genesis. Chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. All right, give me one more. Yes. Worship. Ezekiel 20, 12 and 20. Worship. Not so much. Worship. You're guessing now. All right, let's go. One more. We worship God because he's creator. Hint, angels. Go to Psalm 95. Come on. Psalm Come on, Psalm 95, write these scriptures down. Write these scriptures down. This is the reason why we worship God. He is our creator, and the seventh-day Sabbath has been given to us as that reminder. Psalm 95, look carefully at verse 6. Are we there, friends? It says this, O oh, come, by the way, let's begin with verse 5. The sea is his. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us what, everybody? Worship and bow down. Let us what now? Kneel before the Lord, our maker. That's why we worship God on the seven-day Sabbath. Because he's the maker of heaven and earth and the seas. And listen to a movement that will bring a death decree upon us is connected to preserving earth. Who wrote that script? Let's go. One more. Psalm 100. Let's go. Let's read his friends. Psalm 100. Let's begin in verse 2. Now, I'm going to challenge you, my sister, my amen. I don't see worship there. So verse 2, serve the Lord. With gladness, come before his presence with singing, Know you that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, hath made us. I don't see worship there. Serve. Serve means what? How do you know that? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. Thou, Christ said to Satan, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Him only shalt thou serve. That's it. Psalm 100, verse 2 and verse 3, with Matthew 4 and verse 10. We must be sharp Bible students. I want one more scripture. All right, all the way in the back. Isaiah what? Does that say worship? It does? Okay. Isaiah what? As maker, mm, it doesn't say maker though. Okay, one more. Back, all the way in the back. Isaiah what? 54, 5. Okay, that sounds like it. Isaiah 54 and verse 5. Let's see. Isaiah 54 and verse 5. Ah, oh, preacher. Okay, give me one more. We read that one earlier. So my sister was dozing off in church. <laughs> one last one. Come on, quickly. Uh, Exodus 31, 17. Exodus 31, 17. 
Let's go. Let's close. Revelation. Go ahead. What did I say? Oh, okay. Let's go. Sister, I stand corrected. Amen. Where are we going to? Psalm. Psalm 96. And you reference what verse? For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord, what now? Made. I don't see worship though. Huh? Praise. Amen. Link this with Psalm 100. Let's go. Revelation. Let's close. Revelation. Revel you see, friends, I like doing this to keep us sharp. To keep us sharp. If you go to a butcher, well, we don't butcher. Amen. In the kitchen, you keep that knife sharpened. Amen. All right. As you do your, your, your culinary duties, you keep that knife sharpened. Right, Grandma? Yeah, yeah, yes. Let's go. Where are we going to now? Revelation 4. Amen. All right. Look with me now. Verse number 10. Note these scriptures, my friends. Verse number 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before Christ and the Father that sat on the throne and what everybody? Worship him. That live it forever and ever. Cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. To receive glory, honor, power. Why? For thou hast created. That's it, friends. All things. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. That's why we worship God on the seven-day Sabbath. That's why Sunday has nothing to do with worshiping the Bible. The seven-day Sabbath. And now, lo and behold, we have a movement to save earth. But the movement is Sunday worship, which will bring a death decree upon God's commandment-keeping people, God's seven-day Sabbath-keeping people. There's something, listen, listen. This morning I covered psychological warfare. Have you ever heard of predictive programming? Watch this. I've been covering, how many, how many movies have I been covering that has a, a tenets of predictive programming? Give me one. Songbird. Songbird. Hmm. Leave the world behind. It's coming out spring. Civil War. Here's one more. Add this one to your list. All right. It's called Humane. Humane. Fresh off the press. Fresh off the press. Look at the tag words at the bottom, right here, at the bottom. It says, in the wake of an environmental collapse that is forcing humanity to shed 20% of its population. 20% of the world's population, a family dinner erupts into chaos. When the father's plan, when a father's plan to enlist in the government's new euthanasia program goes horribly awire. All right. You know, friends, I want someone to do the calculation. How many people do they say are in the world right now? Just give me a round number. Eight billion? Let's start right there. What is 10% of 8 billion? Let's make it easier. So what is 20%? 800 times 2 is what? 1.6 billion people. Uh -huh. Do you know inspiration said this would happen? So don't just think movie. Watch this. Clip one. Now again, it's a trailer. This came across my desk from my wife this morning. It's a trailer. Haven't seen it. So, you and I, same time. Listen, watch. While we every day bear witness to the catastrophic ecological collapse that is plaguing our planet, we must not forget that this is, above all, a human crisis. Oh, man, I forgot that. Oh, that's okay. 
The minute I heard a human crisis, I forgot a series of slides to put in the presentation. That's all right, we'll come back to it. It will come back around. So who are they blaming for climate change? An ecological crisis? Humans, humans. Clip two. I am in favor of this government doing whatever it takes to win this war. It's not a war. Wars have opposing sides. Humanity is the opposing side. Hold on. Look at the ticker below the video again. I think I saw something. Again, I'm seeing this with you for the first time. I am in favor of this government doing whatever it takes to win this war. It's not a war. Wars have opposing sides. Humanity is the opposing side. Euthanasia? Endless boost? Hmm. Uh, do you know there's someone who is actually the chief leader in euthanasia? Who? Not him only, but Mr. Floodgates. His father was wrapped up in that. Watch, I'll come to him shortly. All right, move on, clip three. We are engaged in nothing less than a life and death struggle against our own extinction. We are so happy you all joined us tonight for a family dinner. What is going on? So what if you don't volunteer? For humanity to survive, 20% of the population must be extinct. You must volunteer. When that, whenever they say volunteer, just know. Very, very shortly, they will transition from volunteer to a mandate, mandatory. Clip four, listen, watch. We've decided to enlist. What? Hold on, what? So the, the father is saying what? And listen to what? Hmm? To die? Come on. We've decided to enlist. We? What? She's gone. I'm sorry, I can't do it. I will always love you. Hi, I'm Bob. It's them! Oh, they're early. <gasps> Not I have enlisted. No, we. It's Bob. Is Bob there for the trash? <sighs> oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Remember, they use subliminal yes. messages. What's in his hand? A syringe? Hmm. I wonder why syringe? I wonder why? To draw your blood? You're not gonna like this, but we're here to collect two bodies. I already told you Dawn left. And that's unfortunate. Oh! But the rules are the same for everybody. Think about your lives. I'm sure one of you is going to realize that it's not all that great. Now, now, who is writing these scripts for these movies? Who? Because we are told that art imitates what? Life. And life imitates what? Watch carefully. Let's see. Let's see if Sister White ever said anything about this. While appearing, all right, as a great physician, who can heal all their maladies, Satan and his human agents will bring what two things? Disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Populous cities. Which city in America is the most populous? New York. New York. New York. New York. And then where? All right, thank you. And then? Sh Chicago. Somewhere in the mix. Top five. In the mix. And what will they bring? Calamities, pestilences, 
Now watch. Watch carefully. Are they working in the laboratories? Yes, they are, just as it happened in the time of Job. Now watch carefully. Here so let's is, look at each one of these. Don't speak before you're called upon. This is Mr. Floodgates. Hear what he says. What, why would the movie say 20%? If humanity is the problem, why only 20%? If you can go 20, why don't you go 50? Why 20? Where is 20 coming from? Think. Where? It's a script. Now you may speak. So let's look at each one of these and see how we can get this down to zero. Uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Uh, that okay, let's see which one. Uh, first, we've got population. Uh, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. <laughs> do you see how sick he is? Just, just, just put it right inside there. All right. Anyone plans to enlist for these things here? No? No? You'll pass? Pass? Okay. Watch this. 6.8 billion people, 10% is 700 million. 15% is 1.5 billion. But imagine if you have 8 billion people. What is 20%? So where's that number coming from? It's coming from Mr. Floodgates. 10 or 15%. That's where it's coming from. You know, friends, if these men don't repent, do you know we, the saints, if we are faithful and are safe, we'll have front row seats and we will see them burn. Fire and brimstone, the second death at the third coming of Jesus. And their destruction is not going to be quick. Look with me. Chapter 11 of Revelation. Very fitting. Very fitting. While you're going there, listen. Well, over this decade, uh, we believe um, uh, $10 billion over the next 10 years uh, to make it the year of the vaccines. W what does that mean exactly? Well, over this decade, uh, we believe unbelievable progress can be made, both inventing new vaccines and making sure they get out to all the children who need them. They're coming for who? Not mine. Yours? Okay, listen. The benefits there in terms of... Listen how he slips in these words that are very sinister. The benefits there in terms of reducing sickness, reducing the population growth, it really allows the society a chance to take care of itself uh, once you've made that intervention. If you're not listening, you'll miss it. Listen again, a different scene. But uh, the pandemic which you would have thought, wow, global health research to talking about health, being ready for the next pandemic. You know, when you've got millions of deaths, isn't that, you know, it's sad, it's tragic, but isn't it at least there a benefit that health is on the agenda? There's a benefit for millions of people dying. And that was January 19, 2024, clip two, watch this. Shrewd operator. Is the threat of the next pandemic as urgent now as the threat from climate change? Well, they're very different. You know, climate change just gets worse every year as long as you continue emissions. Uh, a pandemic, we're likely to go a fair period of time without either a naturally or intentionally caused pandemic. But when it does strike, uh, you know, we saw it's, you caught it? uh, tens of millions you caught it? of lives. And OK, what he said? Natural or intentional, dangerous, dangerous. Is the threat of the next pandemic as urgent now as the threat from climate change? Well, they're very different. You know, climate change just gets worse every year as long as you continue emissions. Uh, a pandemic, we're likely to go a fair period of time without either a naturally or intentionally caused pandemic. But when it does strike, 
uh, you know, we saw uh, tens of millions of lives and tens of trillions of dollars. Fortunately, the cost. Do you know what's inter interesting? Have you ever heard the media talking heads, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, have you ever heard them sparse his statements? Have you ever heard them take his interview and say, look what he said. What did he mean by this? Mm -mm. Never. Why? But if another prominent person makes a statement that could be taken this way or that way, oh, it's a field day in the media. But not when he makes statements. If you were that interviewer, what would you say? Uh huh. Pardon me? Explain what you mean by intentional. What do you know? Who, where, when, why? But you see, she is feeding him questions that she received. Thank you so much, a script. Okay, let me close this. Uh, a pandemic were likely to go a fair period of time. Enough of this. Friends, let's go. Do you know one thing is always against me? Time. Chapter 11 of Revelation. Let's take a look here at verse 15. Notice as we segue, I have more, but I'll come back. Verse 15, the Bible is speaking about the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet in verse 15. What is a part of the message of the third woe and seventh trumpet? Look at verse 18. It says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. The time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, watch carefully now, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy, God will destroy them which do what? Destroy, destroy the earth. You cannot preach the seventh trumpet message and not address these tyrants destroying the earth. Imagine you preaching this and someone asks you, how is this verse being fulfilled? And you don't have current events. The Bible to them is a dead book. How do I bring this to life? And that's why we give the receipts and the confirmation. Now look at verse uh, verse 14, second woe is past, third woe cometh. When you hear woe, do you think of crises or blessings? Expect the crises to become more and more disastrous. Let me get the Q&A preacher. If I don't start now, I won't get to it. All right? Now, today, we're going to continue addressing the seventh trumpet. Last Sabbath was our baptism, evening, evening of heavenly music. So we are going to pick up from where we left off on March 9th. All right? Let me skip through, skip through these. Uh, no time for this. Okay? Oh, that's it. That's it. Ah, uh, my time. My time. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. All right. Let's come here, friends. Question number one. Question number one is judgment day. It's judgment day. So get to your smartphones. All right. Those of you here locally, those of you online, let's get into our Q&A session. All right. And this is simply a beginning. All right. Let's go. First question. When the preacher give me a thumbs up, I know he's ready. All right. Question number one, which chapter in the book of Revelation chiefly covers the time period between the second woe, that's the sixth trumpet, and the third woe, which is the seventh trumpet? You have four options, and the first option is Revelation chapter 8. Option B, Revelation chapter 9. Option C, Revelation chapter 10. 
Option D, Revelation chapter 11. Please, I'm looking for over 90% on this. Okay? You have 30 seconds. Which chapter in the book of Revelation chiefly covers the time period between second and third woes? Which chapter? Chapter 8, 9, 10, or 11? Okay? And then we're going to get into the depth of this message here this evening, okay? Once we're through, we should be able to comprehend high level of this chapter, okay? Preacher, preacher, end the poll. Let's get the results. Which chapter in the book of Revelation? All right. So we have... Uh, we have 41% uh, chose option C, which is Revelation chapter 10. Who chose option C? Raise your hand. Option C? Option C. Do, that answer is correct. Do you know we covered that question on March 9th? So if I didn't get over 90% on that question, I'm in for a long evening. Let's confirm that. Hold your place in chapter 11 of Revelation. Look carefully at verse 15. Let's compare to confirm. Verse 15 of chapter 11 says, The seventh angel sounded. What is he sounding? A trumpet. All right? Trumpet. Skip on down to verse 18. The last phrase of verse 18 Unto thy servants give rewards, unto thy servants the prophets. Let's go now to chapter 10 of Revelation. As we compare scripture with scripture, where do we find the seventh trumpet? Look at verse 7 of Revelation 10. Verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. And he, as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. Comparing scripture with scripture. Seventh trumpet, chapter 11. Seventh angel sounded with a trumpet, chapter 10. Chapter 10 is your answer. And the second witness is chapter 8 of Revelation. You find the first four trumpets. Chapter 9 of Revelation. You find the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet. All of a sudden, you find the seventh trumpet in chapter 11. Why did we skip chapter 10? Because chapter 10 covers the time period between second war, third war, sixth trumpet, seventh trumpet. Let's go. All right, question number two. We covered that on March 9th. Question number two. Who does the mighty angel of Revelation 10 verse 1 represent everybody. Look at verse 1 before I give you the, the options. Verse 1, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, rainbow upon his head. His face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. All right. Who does the mighty angel represent in verse 1? of chapter 10 of Revelation, you have four options. Option A, Gabriel. Option B, Cherubim. Option C, Seraphim. Option D, Jesus. 30 seconds. When we're through, you should have a general understanding of Revelation chapter 10. Beloved, every, every SDA, Every Seventh-day Adventist should understand Revelation 10. Young and old, everyone. Because this chapter shows your birth as a movement. This chapter shows your message as a movement. This chapter shows the actual mission as a movement. Your birth, mm -hmm, your message, and your mission. 
Every one of us has a birth date. Amen? And everybody has a birth location. Amen? So where do we find the SDA birth location in the Bible? Have you ever thought about that? I have a birth date. When was the birth date for the SDA church? As a movement. You know, you know the date. But I was born somewhere. So where in the Bible do I find the birth location for my church? Where? This chapter, Revelation 10. It's your birthplace. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 And the poor preacher, let's go. All right. So we have 80% chose option D. The answer is Jesus, says 80%. Who chose option D? That answer is correct. It is Christ. Now, raise your hands again. Let me make sure it wasn't an educated guess. Okay? Why do you say Jesus? No, no, behind you. That's what it represents. So that's why she said Jesus. Okay, why do you say Jesus? Okay, so let's go point by point. I'll start where you started. Everybody take your writing instrument. And uh, my sister stated, because Revelation 1 gives the same description of Jesus as this mighty angel. Since you said chapter 1 of Revelation, let's begin with face as the sun. Put underscore face as the sun and feet as pillars of fire. Face as the sun, feet as pillars of fire. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1 to confirm that. Chapter 1 of Revelation, look at verse, verse 14. Verse 14, as a matter of fact, I'm going to begin in verse 13 for the name. Verse 13 says, In the midst of the seven golden candlestick was one like unto whom? The Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. Go to verse 14. His head, you know what? Skip on down. Yeah, skip on down, skip on down. Skip on down to verse 15. Verse 15 says, And his feet like unto what, friends? Fine brass as if they were what? Burned in a furnace. That's Christ. Feet as pillars of what? Fire. All right. Go to verse 16. Let's find the face as the sun. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as what, everybody? The sun shining in his strength. That's Christ. Okay, let's go back to chapter 10. Let's see what other descriptions we find there. What else do we find there? Okay, brother, go ahead. Okay. What, what, what feature in verse 1 are you addressing? What? The cloud. The cloud? Okay. So verse 1 says, The mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. Okay, what scripture? That proof is Christ. Okay. Who has it? Exodus. Exodus 13. Go there. Exodus 13. Look at verse 21. Exodus 13, 21. It says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. That's it. In a pillar of a cloud. So who was in the cloud? The Lord. Which Lord is this? That was in the cloud. Which, which Okay, give me a scripture where it shows Christ is in the cloud. Jesus in the cloud. Come on, cloud. Jesus, cloud. Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand. I mean, mumbling. Marvin. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh, right? He cometh, verse 7, with clouds. Next scripture. Clouds, Christ, clouds. Come on, hint. He's, 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 he is returning with clouds. 
Acts chapter 1 when he went up in a cloud. Acts chapter 1 and verse, verse 9. A cloud received him out of their sight. By the way, what do clouds represent? You mean the, the thing up there? Angels. Wonderful. Okay, so we have cloud. Okay, what else is in chapter 1 and verse 10 of Revelation? Let me go in the back. Yes, Ezekiel 128. Come on. Rainbow. Verse 1, rainbow. Okay, what scripture? Rainbow. So chapter 4 of Revelation... Chapter 4 of Revelation, it says in verse 3, The Father is sitting in the throne, and what is over his head? The rainbow. Father sitting in the throne, rainbow over his head. Look now at Revelation 3 and verse 21. Jesus says, I'm sitting in the same throne with my Father. So what is over his head? What now? The rainbow is over his head. So this mighty angel, in chapter 10 of Revelation, it's Christ. Any more, any more signs? We cover that. Skip on down to verse 3. Verse 3 of chapter 10 says, And cried with a loud voice, as when what roars, everybody? A lion roars. A lion roars. Roars. I want someone to go to Amos chapter 3 and verse 8 and read that scripture. Amos 3 verse 8. I want someone else to go to Hosea. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 10. And a third person to go to Revelation 5 and verse 5. Chapter 5 and verse 5. Raise your hand when you have that scripture. Which one do you have? Okay, my brother, which one do you have? Amos 3, 8, go ahead. What it says. The lion has roared. Who would not fear? The Lord has spoken. Who, who can the prophet? So a lion, everybody, I'm going to repeat this scripture. Could we get, get a microphone, Brother Joseph, uh, uh, Yavuka, please, so I don't need to repeat it? Because you need to understand the symbols. Nothing is here by accident. Please, uh, but Joseph. Give him the microphone again. Read that text again, friends. Get your writing into it. Go ahead, preacher. Slowly, slowly. Okay. Let's go. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Hold on now. Hold on now. So what does it mean the mighty angel roared like a lion? What's happening here? Prophecy. So Revelation 10 is about prophecy. Put it down. Beside chapter 10 of Revelation and verse number 3, the loud voice as a lion roareth, it's prophecy. Which prophecy will get to it? It's prophecy. It's prophecy. Sister, talk to me. Do you have an... Hmm? Yes, Yes, we'll get to it. Next scripture. I gave a three. Let's go. Right there. Revelation 5.5. 5. Okay, go ahead. Revelation 5.5 5 says, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Nothing is accidental. Who is this lion of the tribe of Judah? What are you reading, sister? That's about Jesus. Verse 5, right? Yes. And who is in verse 6 now? John turns to look at the lion, tribe of Judah, and what does he see? The lamb, oh, the lamb. as it had been. Don't, slain. do not return the microphone. The lamb as if it had been slain. So who is this lion's voice? It's Jesus. From, from the tribe of Judah. It's Jesus. Jesus. And what has he prevailed to do? To open the book. Open to the open seals. the book. And what is Revelation 10 about? Opening what? Opening what? A book. A book. A book. It's all connected. It's Christ, the mighty angel. Okay, I'll get to mighty angel. Next scripture. Come on, Carmel. Let's go. 
Pardon me. I'm sorry. Hosea 11:10. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 10. Go ahead. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Mercy. So who is this lion's voice now? Jesus. The Lord's voice. Lord's Everybody voice. go back now. Revelation 10. Is it making sense to you now? That this chapter is about prophecy. It's our birthing place. It's our message. It's our mission. And when you hear it, who cannot but prophesy? Let's go. Where are we? So we covered verse 3. I just want to give you enough to comprehend the chapter. Let's go to verse 2. Chapter 10 and verse 2 of Revelation. I'm going to read verse 2. He, he and, no, stop right there. Stop right there. If someone asked you, are you telling me that Jesus is an angel? How would you respond? Raise your hand. You mean Christ is an angel? You mean like Gabriel? You mean cherubim and seraphim? How would you respond? Come on. Mighty angel. Let me get her, my sister, in the back. Is Christ an, an angel? What does that mean? A mighty angel is Christ. What, what, what does that mean? Come on. Yes. And how would you explain your, your, your answer? All right. Mighty angel. Let's go. Mighty angel. Let's get my sister in the back. How would you explain the mighty angel? Um, the mighty angel is the archangel, the commander. So mighty. The angels. So let's go one step at a time. So the mighty angel is who? He's an archangel. He's an commander. archangel, right? Do you know mighty? Do you know Christ used that word mighty in the Bible? Do you know mighty is linked to Jesus? What text come to mind? Mighty is linked to Jesus. Then I get to angel. Mighty angel. Mighty. Come on. Mighty. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called. Wonderful. Counselor. What? The, come on. The mighty. The mighty. The mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of. Is mighty linked to Christ. Yes. So angel means what now? A messenger. Put that down. Angel in the Bible could mean angelic being, or it could also mean a messenger. A what? A messenger. Go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 14. Chapter 4 of Galatians and verse 14. Angel also means messenger. Paul says, accept me as an angel, a messenger. That's what angel means, messenger. Christ is that mighty messenger. Does that make sense, friends? Mighty angel. Mighty messenger. That's what it is. Okay? Make sense? Make sense? All right. And then, my sister, you could speak about Christ being archangel and so on. If you don't have to go down that road, road route, no need to. Mighty is Christ. Angel, messenger. Case closed. Paul, accept me as an angel. Messenger. Case closed. Okay? All right. Because then you get into Michael. And then someone starts to ask, so who is Michael? Make sense? So if you can avoid that detour, just stay on the highway. If you need to, though, you may. Amen? All right. Next question, preacher. Time. I need them to understand the chapter. Let's go. Question number three. Which book of the Bible is represented by the little book of Revelation 10 verse 2? Four options. Hosea. Option B, Daniel. Option C, Ezekiel. Option D, Zechariah. You have 30 seconds. 
It says in verse 2, he had in his little hand, he had in his hand a little book open. Which book of the Bible is represented by the little book? A, Hosea. B, Daniel. C, Ezekiel. D, Zechariah. 30 seconds. Imagine someone asked you, so what is this little book in his hand? What would you say? Let me call my pastor. Ah, the pastor is on the other line praying for somebody. So you need to know and mark your Bible. Amen? Which book? Hosea, Daniel, Ezekiel, or Zechariah? All right, I see it. And the poll. Here's my first 90. I could feel this one. I could feel this one, friend. It's coming. I could feel it. Hmm. I told you. I told you. Amen. So 92, you see, I set you up. I made sure you had to get it correct. 92% chose option B, the book of Daniel. Who chose that option? Everybody. Daniel. That's it. How do you confirm Daniel? Come on. How do you confirm Daniel? Uh, over here, preacher. Let's go. How do you confirm Daniel? Are we guessing? Let's go. I confirm it by using Daniel, 4, Daniel 12, chapter 4, and Amos 3, 8. Daniel 12, verse 4. Yes. And what? Amos 3, 8. Okay. So Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Let's go there, friends. So hold your place in the 10th chapter of Revelation. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Look at verse 4 through verse 7. Verse 4 through verse 7. This is our birth location. Verse 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Do what, do what, what with the book? So in the book of Daniel, it's what? Sealed, but in Revelation, it's now what? Watch carefully. Verse 4. Seal the book forever. Forever. Even until when? The time of the end. At some point, the book must be opened. And where do you find a book being opened for the last days? Revelation 10. Let's go. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be what, friends? Increased. That's the first identifying mark. The book was closed until the time of the end to be opened. And the only other book in the Bible for the last days opened is the book of Revelation in chapter 10. All right? Second proof. Skip on down to verse 5. Verse 5 says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two. One on this side of the bank of the river, and another person on that side of the bank of the river. Verse 6. And one said to the man, clothed in linen. Who wore linen in the Bible? The priest. Which was upon the waters of the river. How long shall it be? How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? So what was the question? How long until something ends? And of course, verse 7. I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up what? Right hand and left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be how long? Time. Times and uh, half a time. Let's go back. Revelation 10. You'll see it now. Chapter 10 of Revelation, look carefully now at verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he said, right foot upon the sea, left foot upon the earth. Now, what's happening here? So, in the book of Daniel, you see two men, one on one side, one on the other side. In Revelation, it's one person one foot on the left, one foot on the right. Why is it one person? In chapter 10, 
Simple answer. In Daniel 12, they were discussing future prophecy. By the time we get to chapter 10, the prophecy is now fulfilled. That's why it's one person covering land and sea. How do you cover land and sea? You're what? What are you doing? You're traveling by plane, by boat. That's how you cover land and sea. It's the message now that's going across seas to various lands. How do we know that? Look at verse 11. Come on. How do we know it's crossing land and sea? Verse 11. Thou must prophesy again before many what? Peoples and how do you get to many nations? You have to cross seas and get to lands by ship, right now by boats, by airplane. In some cases, by vehicle. Oh, make sense? Skip on down to verse 6 now of chapter 10. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever. You see the same swearing going on here? So that little book open is what? The book of Daniel. Not the whole book. Is talking about the end time prophecies in the book of Daniel. I want someone to repeat what I just said. Raise your hand. What is that little book opened? Let me see if you caught it. What is the little book that's opened? In chapter 10 of Revelation. Give her the microphone. She's brave. What is that little book opened? In the book of the Revelation. Um, the book of Daniel, specifically end time prophecies in Daniel. Did she get it correct? That's it. It's the end time prophecies in the book of Daniel. That little book. Friends, let's go. Question number four. Let's read the verse first, then we take the question. Verse six of chapter 10. It says, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who did create heaven. The things that are therein are. The earth, the things that are therein are. And the sea, the things which are therein, here it is, that there should be time no longer. Question number four. What does the phrase, there should be time no longer, mean? You have four options. Option A, the end of prophetic time. Option B, the end of the world's history. Option C, the end of probationary time. Option D, the end the end of the fourth generation. So my wife just told me what it is. My pen woman, amen? That's all right. Never mind. Just put the answer in the poll question. Amen. 30 seconds. My clock preacher. There should be time no longer. What does that mean? If you came to me and asked me, Pastor, where were you born? Not when. Where? I can tell that location. Where is the birth location of my church. Where can I find it? And then you can ask me, you're now grown. Tell me something about your birthplace. Imagine you come to your birth location. You should be able to explain your birth location. What does there should be time no longer? What does that mean? Four options. What does that mean? What does that mean? Time no longer. What does that mean? All right. Let's go. And the poor preacher. Let's see what we have. All right. Hmm. So we have 61% chose option A, the end of prophetic time. Who chose option A, the end of prophetic time? Praise the Lord. That answer is correct. The end of prophetic time. Everybody, take your writing instrument. Go back 
to Daniel 12. I want someone to answer this question. We are looking for the actual time period when the little book was opened. All right. Do you have that chapter? Do you have it, my friends? Do you still have chapter 10 of the Revelation open? Do you have it? Let's confirm the answer, then I'll go to Daniel 12. Time no longer means the end of prophetic time. It does not mean the end of the world's history. How do we know that? <laughs> Look at verse 11. Thou must do what? If you're prophesying again, that means it's not the end of the world's history. Does that make sense? Question, uh, answer C, the end of probationary time. It could not mean that either. Because you must what? Prophesy again. When probation closes, there's no need to be preaching and teaching. And of course, it could not mean D. It's A, the end of prophetic time. Prophetic time. Time no longer. Time is prophecy. Time no longer. Prophecy. Okay. Go with me to Daniel 12. Daniel 12. I'm going to ask you a question. What did we cover earlier? That confirms Revelation 10 is about prophecy. If somebody gets this, I have a bag for you. How do we know time no longer is addressing the end of prophetic time? What is in the chapter that shows us it's prophecy? Hold on. Let's come right here. Brother Joseph, you, 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 you're on strike? Brother Yavuka, let's go. What is in the chapter that confirms it? It's prophecy. Um, it says that uh, times, time, and half a time. No, 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 no. Uh, that, what are you reading? Daniel. No, no, no. Let's stay in Revelation? chapter 10 of Revelation. Oh, Revelation. Yeah, yeah. What's in that chapter that confirms it's about prophecy? The answer was given to you earlier. Let's see who remembers because it's all building blocks. Come over here. My brother, take her microphone before it burns her hand. It's, it's a hot mic. Hot microphone. Um, my sister, my sister, I don't want to call her name. I'm going to come back to you. Stay right there. Let's go. Uh, the mighty angel has the, the voice of the lion. One more time. The mighty angel has the voice of a lion. So what? Talk so, to us. <clears throat> so if the, the, the lion roars, it's, it's compared to the, the Lord uh, speaking and prophesying. Prophesy. And what scripture you gave? Amos chapter 3, my brother. Amos 3 and verse 8. Prophecy. So time no longer is prophecy. Time no longer is prophecy. No more prophetic time. The Lord's voice, the voice of of a lion. Amos 3, he's prophesying, he's predicting, it's prophecy. So time no longer the end of prophetic time. I didn't have to quote spirit of prophecy. I gave you the Bible first. Because when you go out there, you can't say spirit of prophecy. The guy said, what's that? Ellen White, who is that? Amen? The Bible must speak. Let's go now. Let's go and find the time period when the little book was opened. Let's go. Daniel 12. My sister, you ready now? Let's pass the mic back to her. Okay, here's the question, my sister. In Daniel 12, what does time, times, and half a time point to? What year does time, times, and half a time point to? What year? The, the 1798. Thank you. So just put that mic down. It's very hot. 1798. 
Everybody come with me, take your pencil, your pen. Go to chapter 12 of Daniel. Do you see in verse four where it says, uh, seal that book until when? Until the time of the end. The time of the end is what year? 1798, everybody. Put it down. We covered this previously. 1798. So in 1798, what should we expect? Preacher man in the back. The book should be what? Opened. Somebody, raise the hand. In Revelation 10, the little book was open in what year? Raise the hand. In chapter 10 of Revelation and verse 2, little book open. What year is this? Raise your hand. I don't want any whisperings. Just ra raise your hand. What year is the little book open? If you get this, oh my Lord, we are blessed today. Let's go. 1798. How do you know it's 1798? Because the time of the end is 1798, so the book will be open. Because of Daniel 12, verse 4. Yes, sir. Seal the book until when? Time of the end, 1798. So in Revelation 10, 2, come on now, go back there. Revelation 10, verse 2, we must know our birth location. It's our birth location. And then I'm going to give you a birth date as a movement. Go to verse 2. So what year must you put beside verse 2 of chapter 10 of Revelation? What date? 1798. Everybody, skip on down to verse 6 now. Verse 6. Time no longer. All right. Ready, friends? So we have verse 2 is 1798. I wonder which year we are going to put beside verse 6. Anybody speaks? Don't speak as yet. My sister, keep your hand. I'm going to come to you afterwards. Let's come back here. All right. Question number five. What year did the longest time prophecy come to an end? If I don't get 90%, I'm going home. You have four options. Option A, 1840. Option B, 1844. Option C, 1863. Option D, 1888. You have 30 seconds. Preacher, fix the clock, please. Amen. So you have 30 seconds. What year did the longest biblical time prophecy come to an end? Time no longer. All right? It's prophecy. Time no longer. Once we get this, we can fill in the blank. Once we get this. All right? 30 seconds. We need our birth date. If I don't get over 90%, friends, I'm going home. I have to go home, amen? That's so, amen. End the poll. Let's go. I could feel something coming on. And it's not the influenza. I can feel something coming on. I told you. I felt it coming. 92% chose option B, 1844. Who chose option B? Raise the hand high. That's it, friends. Time no longer. The longest time prophecy came to an end, 1844. Now, hands again. Mm -hmm. uh, get me the microphone, the hot mic over there. What prophecy in the book of Daniel brings us to 1844? Same Daniel. What prophecy in the book of Daniel Point us to 1844. The 2300 years. Thank you, sir. And, uh, no, no, no. Okay. What scripture? Oh, well. 814. Come on. Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, 8 and verse 14. 14. Thank you. So, friends, take now your scriptures. Let's go. Chapter 10 of Revelation in verse 2. What year in verse 2? The book is open. 1798. Skip on down to verse 6. There shall be time no longer. What year now? 1844. That's it, friends. You proved it. We have to be more specific now. What's the month and date? Everybody, let me hear you. 
Month and date. October 22nd. That's your birth date as a movement. Your birth date, October 22nd, 1844. Your birth location is in the United States of America, Revelation 10. The movement was centered in America. It was worldwide, but it was centered. Have you ever heard of Ground Zero? Epicenter? I mean, the earthquake may shake different areas, but the epicenter is right here. The epicenter of your birthplace is America. Okay? All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's go. Question number six. What, what is the mystery of God that should be finished under the seventh trumpet? Friends, we found our birth location. We found our birth date as a movement. What about the message? All right. What is the mystery of God that should be finished under the seventh trumpet? You have four options. Option A, baptism by water and fire. Mm -hmm. Option B, the incarnation of Jesus. Option C, Christ in you, perfection. Option D, gospel preach into, you know what? In all the world, amen. You have 30 seconds. I'm going to put a sign, you know, new pen woman and pen man to be hired. Amen. Let's go. We want to find now what is our principal message. Principal message. Watch now. It's beautiful. The principal message. Okay. 30 seconds. I could feel something coming on again, friends. I feel it coming. I feel it coming. Amen. We must know who we are as a people. Who we are, our birth, our message, our mission. So any church you attend, if you don't hear these things be emphasized, you're in the wrong place. In the wrong place. All right, end the poll, preacher. Let's get the results. What do we have? Hmm. I guess I wasn't feeling the right thing. So we are 63% chose option C. Christ in you, perfection. Who chose option C? That answer is correct. Hands again. What scripture confirms Christ in you, perfection? Raise your hand. What text confirms Christ in you, perfection? Give it to her. Uh, may I ask you a question? It's only three folks over here? Four or five? <laughs> uh, I'm going to start volunteer. I'm going to start just, just choosing people. Let's go. Colossians 1, uh, 26, 27 and 28. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 and verse 28. Okay, let, correct. Let us wrap this up. Go to verse number 7 of chapter 10 of Revelation. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. This is the seventh trumpet. Seven means what, everybody? Completion. And trumpet means what in this sense? The message. This is the final message. Christ in you, the hope of glory which leads to perfection. So what is our message then? Let's go. Chapter 8 of Daniel and verse 14. What does that scripture say that brings us to 1844? Unto 2,300 days, years, then shall what be cleansed? Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So what is the chief Doctrine that comprise our message. Sanctuary. That's it. And must the sanctuary be cleansed? Cleansed of what? Sin. So what must we do with our sins? Surrender them. And once we surrender them, how will God then declare us? Perfect. That's our message. That's it. 
the sanctuary, perfection. That's our message. So if you go to any local church, conference or independent, if this is not being taught, you're in the wrong place. All right, let's go. Question number seven. All right, let's read this. Let's go to verse number eight of chapter 10 of Revelation. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take that little book, End Time Prophecies, which is now open. Mercy. 1798 is now open. In the hand of the angel, which stands upon the sea and upon the earth, it's going worldwide. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me that little book. And then he said to me, take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly how? Bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Come to the screen. Question seven. What does it mean to eat the little book? Mm -hmm. Four options. Option A, to partake of communion. Option B. To eat a plant-based diet. Option C, to accept the entire message. Option D, reading the entire Bible. You have 30 seconds. What does it mean to eat that little book? When you're through, you should have a general understanding of Revelation 10. We're going phrase by phrase. What does it mean to eat that little book? What does it mean to eat that little book? What does it mean? Four options. Four options. And think about this. Imagine the Adventists leading up to October 22nd, 1844. They were preaching this message. You remember, we had children preachers. They were seven, eight, preaching this message. What? This one right here. Adults. And yet we have come to 2024. And that's why I'm motivating, persuading. Come on, parents. Come on. Ask my children. When we have family worship and we sit down, I catechize them. Yeah. Question. They have to give me Bible answers. Go ask them. Ask them. End the poll. Get the results. Come on, friends, let's, 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 let's put that five key, the, the first key into action, conversion. Okay, 87% chose option C. What does it mean to eat that little book? Option C, to accept the end time message. Who chose that one? That's correct, and it makes sense. Since the little book is end time prophecy, by eating it, you're partaking of it. And we're told in... Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971, Paragraph 7, Paragraph 8, the eating of that little book is the comprehension of truth. You're eating it, you're comprehending it. Let's go. Number eight, what does it mean that the book will be sweet in thy mouth as honey? Phrase by phrase, phrase by phrase, allowing each phrase to have its proper bearing on the chapter. Four options. Expecting the second coming. Option B, having a diet of low costs and honey. Option C, getting baptized. Option D, having the fruit of the Spirit. What does it mean? The book will be sweet in thy mouth as honey. Honey. You have 30 seconds. Oh, friends, phrase by phrase, phrase by phrase. So you're able to teach the message. We want to multiply preachers all over the world so we can go home. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So if we don't know the, know the gospel, how are we going to present it? We need to know it. What do you say? Amen. It's right here. Amen. 
All right, friends. Sounds good. What does it mean? The book will be sweet in thy mouth as honey and the pole. Let's see what we have here. So we have... I guess we're hitting reverse now. So we have 70% chose option A, expecting the second coming. Who chose option A? Option A? Amen. Okay, hands again. How do you confirm? <laughs> you thought I was simply going to say amen and move on? No, 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 no. Not today. Sweet in thy mouth as honey. How do you prove that that means second coming? Imagine the person at the park, you're evangelizing and say, how do I know sweet in the mouth as honey is second coming? How do I know that? How do I know that? Now, I'm sure it's the same folks raising hand, hand over here. I'm going to pick on somebody now. Let me see the hands again of those who chose option A. You see no hands going up there. Raise your raise hands. Okay, come over here, preacher. Come over here. Come over here. Amen. Why did you choose, choose option A? Why? Yeah. Sweet in thy mouth as honey. How does that mean second coming? I'm a drill sergeant. How does that mean? How do you get second coming from that? I want to know. Because it's, there's nothing sweeter than the coming of Christ. <laughs> there's no. Hmm. I'm sold. Amen. But I need Bible. Bible. Okay. Who's next? Come over here. How do we know sweet as honey means second coming in the mouth? Let's go. Uh, this is just an educated guess. Let's go. Let's go. Um, so Psalm 19, verse 10. Mm -hmm. uh, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweet Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Yeah. So here in this country, this scripture, rather, uh, honey is something that is to be desired. And in Hebrews, I believe, Hebrews chapter 9, maybe, uh, speaking of those who are, who are looking for or love is appearing. I think I got Hebrews off. <laughs> but to, to something to desire, mm -hmm. those who are looking for. Okay. I'll take that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're closer than my brother here. Anybody else? Bible? Anybody else? Why would the Bible use? I'm giving you the hint. Let me go here. Come on. Come on. Why would the Bible say it's in thy mouth sweet as honey? You see, we know the historical context. Because we have great controversy, and we have the history book. So we know it's second coming, but how do you prove it from the Bible? Let's go. How? Um, I was, well, it's two parts. The first part, because we know the little book is speaking of that end time prophecy of 1844, and during that time, they were expecting the second coming of Christ. So that's why it was sweet as honey. And then in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3, when... Um, he tells him to eat of it, and he says it's in that mouth as honey for sweetness. So when he takes it in the scroll, so that was the two reasons. May I augment that? Yes. I wouldn't go to Ezekiel 3. Okay. I wouldn't go there. Okay. Let's stay in the context. Mm -hmm. What was in that little book? It was the end time prophecy. prophecies. Mm -hmm. What's the, what is the end of all prophecies? Christ's second, second coming. coming. You said chapter 8 of Daniel, verse, verse 14, 14, the cleansing of what? The sanctuary. When the sanctuary is cleansed, what's the next event? Christ comes. The second coming. Mm -hmm. So what else could it be? But that. That's how you prove it, number one. The cleansing of the sanctuary. That brings you to 1844 time no longer. The context is once the sanctuary is cleansed, the next event is second coming. Amen? Now, there's something else there, though. Why would the Bible use that symbol of honey? Where's the, where's the first place in the Bible? You tell me. I want to I give it to you. Where's the first place in the Bible? Honey 
is used to represent a place. Think. Keenan! Keenan! A land flowing with? And it was the earthly promised land. That's why the symbol is used. It's not sweetness. It says, in thy mouth, sweet in thy mouth as honey. So the emphasis based on grammar is, is not the sweetness. It's the what? It's the honey. Sweet as honey. So in the Bible, where do we find honey linked to a place? Let's go to Exodus 3. Exodus what chapter? That's why it's used there. Exodus 3. And we come down to, let's find honey somewhere. Verse 8. I, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land unto a what now? Good land, a large, unto a land flowing with what? That's it. And if you trace the word honey all the way through, it points you to Canaan. It points you to a place where you will not grow. You will inhabit You'll get food you didn't grow, homes you didn't plant. And Christ said in how, homes you didn't build, homes you didn't plant. Lord have mercy. Um, homes you did not build. In John 14 now, verse 1 and 2, verse 3. Let not your be troubled. You believe in, believe also in, in my Father's house. How many what? Case closed. Let's go. Question number nine. Ready, preacher? We have probably two more, and we close. Question nine. Does that make sense, though? Do you see it now, friends? The honey? First, on the prophecy side of it, one sanctuary is cleansed, second coming. Amen? By the way, how, <laughs> how do we know one sanctuary is cleansed next to second coming? How do we know that? Preachers, are you on strike? Come on, man. Uh, do you work with the union? Let's go. How do we know sanctuary cleanse next second coming? Um, because the pattern of the actual earthly sanctuary, once they cleanse the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement, the priest comes back out, and there's the scapegoat, takes the sins away, and then they... Leviticus 16. Oh, Once the priest cleanses the sanctuary, he takes off what? And put on what? King robe. He comes as king. Amen. Let's go. Where are we now? Where are we? And then number two, the first place you find honey is linked to the land of Canaan. Okay? Don't forget that. Friends, we must be as sharp as a rake. <sighs> All right. Let's go. Question number nine. What does it mean that the little book would be bitter in the belly? You have four options. The Bible would be burned. Option B, people persecuted and killed. Option C, they would have a great disappointment. Option D, the Bible would be disproven. 30 seconds. What does it mean that the little book would be bitter in the belly. Beloved, I can't be everywhere, impossible. You will meet people I will never get the chance to meet. You are sent to evangelize. Your purpose of being a baptized Seventh-day Adventist Christian is to give this message, theory, and experience, practicality, practical, to those around you. And that's why we come to be equipped. Phrase by phrase, word by word. So we have a better grasp of the message. Some people are timid to evangelize because they don't really comprehend the message. And they would be embarrassed if questioned and they have no answer. So the better thing, the better thing for us to do is to study together, amen? But we won't be studying and then when we finish study, then we go. We have to do both simultaneously. 
Study and go, study and go. Amen? That's it. End the poll. Amen. What does it mean the little book would be bitter in the belly? I'm closing in seven minutes. Let's go. And the poor preacher, what do we have? Yes, uh, we are going in the opposite direction, friends. 63% chose option D, option C. They would have a great disappointment. Who chose option C? Bitch in the belly. You're afraid now to raise your hand? Because you know what's coming next. Okay, come right here. Come right here. Use it, option C. From the Bible, how do you prove bitter in the belly means disappointment? Right here. Hot mic. Go ahead. How do you know that? I can't give the text, but I know that. Just give me something. That, okay. When in 1844, uh, the message was sweet to them that Jesus was coming. And then he did not come when they expected him to come, so they were disappointed. Mm -hmm. In the end time, mm -hmm. Jesus... No, stop, 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 stop. That's it. Bitch in the belly. Good. Good. So you are building off the sweet in the mouth as honey. So since sweet in the mouth means looking for the second coming, then bitter must be the opposite, right? Okay, good. I want Bible. Bible. Amen. B-I-B-L-E. Bible. Let's go. How do we know bitter in the belly? Bitter means disappointment. Bible. Let's go. By verse 11, it said, thou must prophesy again. So what I get it from it, because context is key, okay. that if it was... If it She's was sweet, using my words against me. <laughs> context <laughs> is key. It's king. All okay. right. Okay. 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 So if it, right. was, if it was bitter, that means they were disappointed, okay. but God is telling them, go and prophesy okay. again. I want Bible. More Bible. Oh. More Bible. <laughs> bitter. How do you know bitter means disappointment? Bitter. Come on, open. Because remember, when you're teaching the word, the Bible must explain itself. Let's go. Jeremiah 15, 16, and 17. Jeremiah 15, well, 16, and 17. That's where he was saying he will eat it, the roll. It will, it, it, it will be sweet. Okay, Jeremiah 15. Does he say bitter? Mm. By principle, yes. But it doesn't say bitter. I want bitter. Because that's the word you're tracing. You see, friends, I'm, I'm persuading you to go to the concord, look up the word bitter, and find the texts that tell you what bitter means in the Bible. Why would the Bible use bitter? It could have said sweet in the mouth, but salt in the belly. Why bitter? Food, food aren't the sweet and bitter. He was a sweet and sour. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So let's go. Sweet or bland. Why bitter? Is it let's in, go. In Mara, when they drink the water, bitter. You're getting and somewhere. So Mara or Mara, the water was bitter. Therefore? They are murmuring. They are disappointed. D -d disappointment. Because they were thirsty, hoping to get water. But when they got there, it could not be drunk. Disappointment. Wonderful. Numbers chapter, what's that? Exodus 15, chapter 15? 15, 15. Somewhere, somewhere. Okay, 15? 15, 15, amen. Give me one more scripture, more pointed. Bitter, concordance. It's a Bible class, Q&A, let's go. Bitter, because when you find the scripture, you won't forget it. When you, f my brother here will never forget that scripture because he found it. He dug for it. I saw a hand over here. Let's go, my sister, let's go. Uh, Exodus 12, verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Okay. So I'm going to help us all with the process. Not every scripture that says bitter is applicable. Okay. Give me one more. Bitter. Come on, friends. Bitter. You want to try now? You ready? Let's go here. Bitter. Friends, we cannot be just passive attendees in Bible class, active. Let's go. The Proverbs 27, 7 says, the full soul loatheth 
uh, and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Mm. That doesn't hit the spot. Doesn't hit the spot. Let's go, preacher. Isaiah 520. Warn to them that call evil good and good evil. Okay, one last one. It doesn't hit the spot. And I like us doing this because now we can work through the process. Not because a word is in the concordance, it means it fits. Doesn't mean that. Bitter. Disappointment. Discouragement. Dismay. Let's go. Um, Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Stop. A voice was heard in Ramah. What is the voice saying? Uh, lamentations and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children refused to be Lamentations comforted. and bitter what? Weeping. What were they doing October 22nd? Weeping. 1844. Lamentations, weeping, bitter weeping. That's the bitter. Make sense now? So don't be dismayed at the process. We got some that didn't fit, but so far one is the nail in a sure place. Come on, brother. You got one more. Come on, give me one more. Bitter. Anybody else? Bitter? Isaiah? That was, uh, that was Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Jeremiah 31, 15. Let's go. Amos 8, 10. Go ahead. Let me hear it. And I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness yes, upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day. That's it. A bitter day. Mercy. Amen. So now you see what texts to use. One more. You got one more. Amen. Let's go to uh, Job, Job 3. Job chapter 3, Job chapter 3 and verse 20. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery and life unto the bitter in soul, bitter in the belly, bitter in the soul, misery. It's all there, my friends. Let's close. All right. Question number 10. Was the study fruitful? Is the study fruitful so far? Is it helpful? Preacher, ready, friends? Ready, preacher? Question 10. What message must be prophesied again before peoples and nations? That's chapter 10 and verse 11 of Revelation. You have four options, three options. Option A, the first and second angel's messages. Option B, the second and third angel's messages. Don't answer as yet. Option C, the third and fourth angel's messages. The question is this. What message must be prophesied again based on the context? Prophesy again. Before peoples and nations. You have 30 seconds. Go ahead, prayerfully. The key phrase is contextually. What messages or message must be prophesied again based on the context of chapter 10, verse 11 of Revelation that must go to many peoples, nations? What is that? First and second, second and third, third and fourth. Let's go out with a bang, my friends. Please don't let me have a bitter weeping going home. But give me some sweetness as honey to go home with. Amen. And that's why God gave us this name for our ministry. Prophesy again. It's our birthing place. So I will never forget our birth date, our birth place, our message, our mission. Can't forget it. Can't forget it. All right, preacher. Do you think they're ready? Let's go. End the poll. End the poll.
I told you, bitter lamentation <laughs> and weeping. Not Rachel now, but Andrew weeping for his children, <laughs> weeping for his uh, brothers and sisters that's safe to serve and first time viewers. My friends, 45% chose option B, second and third angel's messages. Who chose option B? Raise your hand. That answer is incorrect. Incorrect. 29% chose option C. Third and fourth angels' messages. Who now chose option C? Raise your hand. Only one hand? Two? That answer is incorrect. <laughs> of course, option A is the answer. Contextually, if you're prophesying again, again means what? Repeat. So what was, what was preached? The third was never preached before October 22nd, 1844. Nor was the fourth. It's the first and second. The first and second. Let's confirm, then we close. I think that's it. That's it? Let's go. Let's go to the book of chapter 10 of Revelation. Look at verse 11. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again, before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. If you're prophesying again, that means this message went to the same places. Where do we go now in the Bible to find a message going to uh, peoples and nations and tongues? Where do we find that? Everybody, come on. Revelation 14. Go there now. We close. Chapter 14, verse 6. I saw another what now? Fly in the midst of heaven, having what now? Everlasting gospel. Do you see what is in chapter 10 of Revelation? The, the what? Everlasting gospel. So which church has the everlasting gospel? The church of Revelation 10. 1844. We have it, friends. We have it. Verse, verse, verse 6. Uh, to preach unto them that dwell where? Earth. Nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Saying what now? Fear God and what? Give glory to him. Why? The hour of his judgment is come. Stop right there. What is in chapter 10 that mentions judgment? Come on. Judgment. What phrase in chapter 10 of Revelation amplifies and speaks of judgment. Anybody? Judgment? Chapter 10? Judgment? D Friends, if you're silent because you want to go home, you're going to stay here much longer. Come on, talk to me. Let's go. Come on. What is it now? Verse 6, there shall be time no longer. Time no longer. Which brings us to what date? October 22nd, 1844, judgment is come. Amen? Amen? Okay. And what is in verse 7? And worship him that what? Come on. And worship him that what? Made what? Heaven, earth, sea, and what? Question. What commandment is that in principle? Fourth commandment. Do you know the Sabbath commandment is in chapter 10 of Revelation? That's my last point. Seventh-day Adventist is in chapter 10. Go there with me. Chapter 10 of Revelation, I won't tell you. I want you to search, scan quickly, verse 1 through verse 11. You raise your hand. By the way, take your piece of paper with your pencil and get a new sheet of paper and write the verse. Big verse on it. If it's verse 1, 1. Verse 2, 2. I don't want to hear anybody yet. Lest you just simply copy somebody else. What verse do you think mentions the seven-day Sabbath? The sooner you get the answer, 
we leave. Okay? And remember, the sun has not yet set. So you're on my time now. You're on God's time. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go. I say these things to get your blood flowing still, because you're sleeping on me. Okay, paper, let's go. Let's go. You know what? Come on, raise them up. Good. Down. Let me see. All right. I can't see that. You're in the back. I see that. I see that. Come on, preacher. All right. All right. I see that. Up, up. Okay. <laughs> I see that. That's big and bold. I can't see yours. Okay. Everybody, you're good. You're good. Let me see your fingers. Okay. Let me see your fingers. Your fingers. Verse 1. Okay. Yes. What do you have? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Amen. Everybody, what is it? Verse 6, let's read that and we go. Verse 6, it says, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who did create heaven, the things that therein are, the earth, the things that therein are, the sea, and the things which are therein. That's Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now you know your birthplace as a Sabbath keeper is Revelation 10. You have your message. We must go where now? Let's go. Let's go. Let's pray. Okay, uh, before we do that, how many stars you got? So we had 10 questions. Who had 10 stars? 10 correct. 10 stars? 10 stars? 9 stars. Wonderful. 9 stars? 8 stars. 7. 7 means completion. That's it. No more. 7. Okay. Keep working at it. Work on it, friends. I'd rather we get some wrong here. Correct them so when we go out there, we are on point. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for our time spent in your presence. You have given to us the three watchwords to watch, pray, and work. If we don't work, we're dying spiritually. You have given to us our mission. You have given to us a message. May we be faithful with the calling you have placed upon our lives. And may we understand that when we put you first, your ministry, your mission, that you would take care of all of our needs. That's your promise. This week, may we be on the lookout for one soul. If we really want to grow spiritually, we have to share. And souls are heading to perdition. And many of them would love to get a warning, to heed the warning before it's too late. Now, Father, we turn our attention to this new week. We know not what to expect. But we know you know the end from the beginning. But praise your name that we don't have to worry, be anxious. We don't need to fret for tomorrow because tomorrow will take care of itself. But if we seek you first and your righteousness, then all things will be added unto us. May we have the peace that surpasses all understanding. May we receive that bread in the morning, that word from the Lord, that will be meat in due season to encourage, to direct our paths, 
to strengthen our weary souls. As we consider those five keys of survival, we realize that there's still work for us to do, spiritually, physically. But again, we claim the words of Philippians 1.6. Since you have brought us to this point on the journey, why should we become discouraged? Yes, we have far to go, but by your grace, we have come from far. And since you have taken us to this point, you will see us through. So being confident of this very thing, he who hath begun the good work in us, that he will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. May the lines fall in pleasant places for each one of us this week. May we see our cup filled and running over with blessings this week. We expect great things from you this week because you are a great God. May we never complain. May we never murmur. But may we trust that you will bring forth what you have promised. And when we encounter discouragements and setback, may we see in calamities blessings. May we see in woes <laughs> mercies. May we see in setbacks <laughs> prevention from Satan's greater attack. Lord, we trust you and we put our souls in your hands and we believe that you're faithful to keep that which we have committed to you against that day. Into your hands we commend. Into your hands we commit the keeping of our souls. I pray our bread basket will never run empty. Please, Lord. See us times are ahead of us. Times which will make men wish they were never born. But I know, we know who holds the future. We know Jehovah Jireh. We know our God shall provide because he has provided and he is providing into your hands, Lord. Everything belongs to you. Take us home safely. Bring us back at the appointed time. Dismiss us with blessings and joy is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.